So welcome uh, everyone to this Resilience Cafe discussion. Uh, thank you very much for joining in. And uh, for all those who have been following us, this is our third edition. So welcome back to all our uh, followers uh, on, on Facebook and on other social media. It's good to be here. So very happy new year to everyone. Uh, today we have a very, very interesting discussion around an issue that has not been really tackled, at least in the humanitarian sphere, and that is really about navigating sustainable energy and disaster resilience nexus. But I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment. Let me also introduce to you our very, very eminent panelists today uh, who are on uh, with me enjoying this coffee in their own respective places, unfortunately. I would have loved to host them uh, in, in a cafe here. <clears throat> Be that as it may, uh, uh, first of all, let me introduce Harish, Harish Hande. Uh, he's based out of Bangalore, uh, he's an engineer and a renewable energy entrepreneur with over 23 years, 23 plus years of experience. He's of course co-founder of Selco Solar Light Private Limited, currently CEO of Selco Foundation. Uh, well, he's very, very well-known figure to all of you uh, around the world as a pioneer of rural energy. And of course, he's been recognized by the Raman Max Hesse Award in 2011. So he's truly a global figure, very fortunate that he's joining us for this discussion. Um, of course, uh, as I said earlier, he's a graduate from IIT Kharagpur and master's and PhD from University of Massachusetts in US. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, uh, let me stop here. Uh, there's a lot to say about him. And also joined, uh, uh, joining me here is uh, Harjit, uh, Harjit Singh, he's ActionAid's Global Climate Lead. Hi, Harjit. And uh, he specializes in the impact of climate change on the global south, uh, especially issues around migration and climate finance. Uh, he's the member of the United Nations Technical Expert Group on Comprehensive Risk Management under the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. Uh, he's also on several boards, including the uh, Climate Action Network Board. And of course, we know him as the go-to person for anything to do with the climate change adaptation piece uh, in the Global South. And also, I'm very happy to have my dear colleague Shruti uh, joining us uh, in this uh, call. Shruti is an architect by training and has earned a degree from Rizvi College in Mumbai. She has a keen interest in uh, sustainable architecture and working on indigenous material and natural ecology. Uh, she was uh, recently responsible for this one project that we did together with Selco, Harish's organization in Orissa, following Cyclone Fawny, uh, which was, as you know, a devastating cyclone that hit uh, that part of our country. <clears throat> So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, her experience. Uh, just to uh, also come to the main topic of our discussion today, and it is, as I said, uh, talks about, uh, uh, you know, how do you uh, look at navigating sustainable energy and disaster resilience nexus? And the issue for us, I mean, you know, we have talked a lot about uh, the role of sustainable energy in the larger uh, you know, the climate action, the climate mitigation piece of work, but does it have a role in enhancing disaster resilience? That was an uh, initial discussion Harish and I had uh, over several cups of tea, both in India and many other meetings. And I'm glad we could translate that into an experiment that we carried out uh, in the uh, post Fawny uh, experience in the disaster recovery experience in Odisha. Uh, we do find this as an area that has been overlooked, but going forward when, you know, you are seeing increasing phenomena of climate related events, extreme events, I think uh, with that increasing uh, rate and intensity, the role of decentralized energy system, off-grid systems, like the way we saw one in Vanuatu, where those households that had those decentralized grid systems could function uh, or, or could recover much faster than those who are not after the tropical cyclone struck that uh, country a few months ago. 
So I think there is a proof of concept uh, in place. Uh, how do you expand on that? How do you uh, make it work in other sectors, not just uh, you know thinking of making solar uh, houses and uh, you know bringing solar energy, but looking at it as a larger um, operational piece in in across sectors. And I think that's that's the area that we want to explore uh, through this discussion today. So before I start, maybe I would request uh, Shruti to provide us with a brief background about the work we did so that it becomes our reference point uh, in our subsequent discussion. So Shruti, over to you, and then we'll uh, get into the conversation. Uh, thank you, Manu, sir. So we here at SAIDS have been working closely with the team at Selco Foundation since about a year now to put together sustainable energy solutions to enable faster recovery after disaster and build long-term community resilience in Puri district of Orissa. So to provide a bit of a context, the state of Orissa is highly prone to multiple hazards such as cyclones, floods, and earthquakes due to its geographical location. In fact, a cyclone hits the state almost every year in uh, May 2019, Cyclone Foni, an extremely severe storm made landfall near south of Puri district. It led to loss of lives and livelihoods and uh, severely damaged the built infrastructure in the state. Uh, the power sector was hit hardest and the electrical infrastructure of the district, such as towers and transmission lines, were devastated for kilometers. Uh, some villages did not have access to electricity for almost uh, a month after phoning. Uh, this not only impacted the delivery of services, uh, essential services such as healthcare and emergency response after the disaster, but also affected the daily requirements of the communities like basic access to lighting and ventilation in their homes and clean water. The only alternate uh, the people had was to use diesel powered uh, generators, which is not the most reliable option and uh, you know, more so during the time of crisis. We came across many stories, uh, you know, from our intervention areas that moved us. So one of the residents, Basanti Nayak, had to travel uh, over an hour and pay an exorbitant price every time she had to charge her mobile phone. Uh, the Orissa government is quite a role model in disaster preparedness with accurate dissemination and early, uh, dissemination of early warning and uh, efficient evacuation plans. But we felt that there was a need to strengthen and accelerate the recovery effort in the post-disaster scenario. So to understand the local vulnerabilities and the immediate needs of the community post uh, the cyclone, we conducted multiple rounds of uh, household surveys, risk assessments, and focus group discussions. Based on the assessment, we felt that you know, tapping uh, into sustainable energy in interventions could secure the en uh, energy needs of the public and the community infrastructure, as well as build capacity at the local level to respond to future emergencies uh, a bit more independently and more efficiently. Therefore, we decided to intervene in a primary school that also serves as a cyclone shelter in Bira Narsingpur village, the community health center in Chanipur and the surrounding community settlements. Uh, the interventions there were planned, uh, firstly, to repair the buildings because uh, they were in a really dilapidated state and uh, uh, to ensure the safety of the occupants. The energy requirements of the building were then uh, reduced by installing energy efficient fixtures and using passive design techniques such as uh, light reflective paints on the uh, roof and wall and strategically positioned landscape elements to optimize the size of the solar panel system that was required to power the energy needs of these buildings. The solar panel systems were then installed to uh, power crucial electrical equipment fixtures and mobile charging stations. These systems have been designed to provide adequate power backup at household levels. Uh, home lighting units were installed to run uh, lights, fans, and mobile charging units in the transitional shelters to secure the energy needs of the communities. The interventions will not only secure the continuity of the functional user space, aiding safe evacuation measures, but also provide psychological well-being for the community by keeping the communication channels open. During Cyclone Phony, many women gave birth in the health center without sufficient light and water supply provision in the labor room. 
with sustainable energy infrastructure in place we have secured such needs and powered the critical life saving medical equipment such as the radiant baby warmers reducing the risk of new uh, natal mortality in the area discussions with the chc staff also highlighted issues of stark increase in cases of diarrhea and other waterborne diseases post the disaster installation of water filtration system powered by solar energy in the cyclone shelter will provide communities with access to safe drinking water even in the absence of grid power supply to make the program a bit more comprehensive training programs in the communities were conducted to build their capacity in sanitation and hygiene practices disaster risk reduction and maintaining solar and maintaining the solar panel systems that were installed in these buildings uh, further tying the program with our organizational strategy to focus on climate emergency and enabling youth leadership we installed carbon footprint calculator in the school to make children uh, more aware and initiated sustainability practices such as waste segregation and composting a weather lab has also been installed in the school to sensitize children about the climate change by training them to observe and record changes in their microclimate over a period of time for the benefit of the audience and whoever is interested to know more about the project we have the report uh, on our website and we'll also be sharing a link in the comment section uh, i hope i've been able to provide some context for the larger discussion today and i'm excited to hear from the other speakers as to how can we build on this experience further uh, thank you manu sir over to you thank you thank you shruti for sharing this experience uh, very very nice uh, stories and very compelling uh, case that you have built for you know uh, looking at a larger ecosystem in an at scale kind of approach uh, to this uh, uh, the, this whole nexus bit and uh, just to remind the audience i mean uh, uh, shruti is there but uh, i would really be grateful to also colleagues in selco uh who worked uh, day and night together with our team in the field and uh, we we brainstormed a lot so what she presented today is an essence of a lot of uh, mind space that uh, was utilized over the last um, year and a half where uh, colleagues from swalco uh, as well as our partners on the ground and shruti and her colleagues here uh, worked together to make this happen so thanks very much uh, shruti and uh, yes uh, she referred to this report and please uh, if you want more on this work of selco and seeds uh, it's already on the link on the facebook um, right now as we speak um uh, just to remind you also if you have any questions uh, from the audience uh, please feel free to type them in and we'll take them up towards the end of this discussion So now moving on to our uh, great speakers here, um, Harish. First question to you. I mean, um, great uh, first round of cooperation on this uh, very very exciting work that uh, I was personally, uh, you know, watching over all the challenges and all those little mindsets that we had to overcome to be able to reach to this level. Yes, of course, it's still work in progress. A lot more needs to be done. But yeah, one question that comes to Uh, mind is how do we really uh, you know i mean we don't have an ecosystem we don't have that awareness as of now on this um, issue and how do we enable that and what do you think would be are the challenges that we um, uh, should expect on our way arish yeah thanks thanks manu for this and thanks for inviting me uh, here along with harjit um, thanks to shruti for uh, for for giving this uh, Uh, synopsis here see manu see as we had discussed before um, uh, what we would like to have and from coming from the sdg 7 or the sustainable energy space uh, where sustainable energies are always thought as an afterthought uh, in a sense ke ho gaya pehle program bana lete hain jaise for example in all fields whether it's disaster yeah. education health pehle phc bana do fir dekhte hain solar energy kaisa kiya jata hai rather than thinking from day one so we miss out on opportunities like uh, building efficiency pehle building efficiency dekho why should we use uh, solar lighting during day time for example why should i use solar powered fan during day time if my ventilation so first we need to look at design look at efficiency of materials like rice mills to uh, baby warmers to dental chairs and then final yeah what happened 
I think we lost. Yeah, sorry, uh, oh, Harish, no. we lost you for a moment. If you can just oh, repeat okay. the last bit. Yeah, sorry, just the last bit. The last okay, so what? Haan, so what I was saying ki, ki solar energy is always looked as a last part of it, right? It's like, like it's always thought as an afterthought, not as the part of it. Uh, whether yeah. we talk about a building design, a daylighting, etc., etc., it's like ठीक है बाद में देखा जाएगा solar. Same thing education mm. and health में पहले हम लोग build कर देते हैं फिर उसके बाद solar देखते हैं and that is the most inefficient way of utilizing solar because for example uh, solar uh, when you design a solar for a sewing machine you get blamed ki solar is expensive nobody says that a sewing machine is inefficiently designed right if mm. sewing machine was efficiently designed solar would have been effective today so we pay for so so in why we are excited manu in the dis- i mean nobody should be excited of disaster but the question is disaster is comes in various phases whether it is mm. floods disaster mm. droughts everything else it pushes innovation to its best in terms of if you are able to create equipments that are mm. highly efficient and reliance for disaster mm. then it could be viable for any other applications mm. you have the most efficient most rugged most uh, what you can where you can <clears throat> move it and mm. that is where people SDG seven and people like, organization like, that we should start working like organizations with you mm. because it would enhance technology delivery models at to the best and that's where SDG seven not only whatever Shruti mentioned the benefits of it but it's a larger mm-hmm. uh, game that how do we make people resilient mm. enough mm. that half the disaster money that seeds raise mm. goes as a band aid mm. rather than Going it as a okay, boss. This year, खराब हो गया इतना. Next year, come खराब हो. Next year, come. Yeah. Not every year we actually start from zero, and that's why SDG seven can play a role, Manu. No, great. I think this point around uh, you know uh, how do we bring this efficiency by design, and so this doesn't become an afterthought, is definitely one learning. In fact, uh, as you rightly said, I mean disasters do test. our capabilities you know um, right i mean in this uh, like this report we thought that you know uh, it tests us in terms of these four things um, reliability efficiency affordability and sustainability all four stretched to the very very extreme to their limits really you know how can you make cheapest possible things because obviously the people who are affected are the poorest the most marginalized and and therefore affordability and as well as reliability i mean you know uh, all these uh, systems where you have an alternative in place needs to have that robustness that reliability in 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 you know in, in the design itself uh, uh now we come back to that a uh, little later as to how do we make this into like a practice and not uh, uh not like an after thought ki you know kuch kar do ab energy mein and you know make it efficient when you have already done the damage you know so uh, i think we'll come back to that uh, question as to how do you make this an industry standard but uh, in the meantime uh, let me check with harjeet uh, who's been working a lot on the policy stuff and Uh, largely i guess uh, harjeet you've been looking at policy from very much from that mitigation lens and you know the the carbon lens as you would put it uh, reducing emissions and you know therefore the need for energy and sustainable energy but what do you think i mean you know in light of this discussion that we are having today um, what would be that policy uh, peace or policy um, environment that we need to create to be able to reach to the level that harish just mentioned for example uh, hajit so uh, thanks manu thanks uh, to you and seeds for um, inviting me and be part of uh, this discussion with you harish <laughs> shruti uh, it it is definitely a, a very important topic and uh, as uh, as you rightly said you know there are so many opportunities but we have not been able to really harness because the policy space is not yet ripe um no doubt the discussion on renewable energy uh, started much more from a from a very um, mitigation uh, centric perspective and rightly so that was the starting point um the challenge has been it took a long time to arrive 
at, a, at an understanding that you need to look at energy beyond mitigation and the potential that this transformation uh, that we are seeing now uh, and which is going to be paced up in the next few years um, has, been, has been overlooked. Uh, we've only talked about clean energy and not looked at the potential it can offer in terms of social justice. You know, at Action, mm -hmm. something that we have been doing is talking about decentralized community controlled renewable energy access. And in your work as well, and what I'm sure uh, I know Harish has been doing, talking about decentralization. Now, when you talk about resilience, you know, as we as we say very simply, putting all eggs in one basket, you know, if you have one big corporate player supplying energy and then you have a decentralized model, uh, which is community controlled, that itself can build resilience. Nobody talks about it from that perspective. It offers uh, social justice, you know, it offers economic justice. So the bigger piece that are connected to what we are now talking in terms of climate justice or ecological justice, it cannot be achieved unless we embed it with social justice mm -hmm. and economic justice. You know, if this transformation happens where the same big energy companies are now getting to solar or wind and they continue to control um, this new renewable energy transformation, I think that will be such a missed opportunity and we will not be able to undo that. Um, so as Harish said, each disaster brings an opportunity. Right now, climate crisis has provided such an amazing opportunity to, to relook and, and overhaul the entire energy system and why it is important and something very interesting that we need to recognize. You know, fossil fuel have been centralized resources. There are only few places where you can go dig coal and, and you know, uh, get oil. Whereas yeah. renewable energy itself is decentralized. You're talking mm. about solar. Yes, you don't get wind everywhere, but still a lot more places where, you know, unlike fossil fuel. So if the energy source is decentralized, how can we allow that transformation to be so centralized? So, uh, so that perspective, needs to be there and and the work that that uh, seeds does in terms of working with communities and humanitarian space how do we then involve communities how do we then use this as an entry point to advance social and economic justice i think that has to be there and that's where policy space is not is not even talking about it enough and let me just uh, close by uh, saying that in the international space manu uh, the term energy democracy is picking up pace. And all the elements that I'm talking about are now getting enshrined in that in that fight, you know, about energy democracy. And that is central to build resilience, be it disaster, be it economic, or be it social resilience. So I think that needs to be understood. No, no, absolutely. I completely agree with you. I mean, this whole piece around uh, energy democracy uh, opens up this new uh, new uh, way of thinking, if I would uh, like to put it that way. I mean, you know, this, uh, this social justice and economic justice principles have never actually taken into consideration that energy and access to energy, just like we've looked at access to communications and technology or even financial inclusion, uh, has never really even dawned uh, to us, you know, from that point of view. And I, I feel that if we start doing a policy construct, uh, 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 taking this entry point of, you know, social justice, then I think uh, this SDG 7, what Harish, you mentioned, makes uh, perfect uh, sense. So yeah, thanks for bringing in this uh, perspective on um, you know the the access and social access uh, uh, and, and and how energy access is you know as fundamental as any other uh, social justice uh, principles uh, that we spoke about. Great. So we'll just come back to this uh, more uh, this whole issue uh, a little more in depth. But uh, at this point, maybe uh, Harish, I would like to check with you as to you know, uh, <clears throat> do you think right now um, there is like, of course, you run a 
energy company and uh, you know that is a model in itself uh, do you think it can become a standard an industry standard is there capacity already to support this kind of a aspiration if you would like to take that path um, more that is based on the principles of social justice about you know issues like we spoke about reliability efficiency sustainability affordability all these principles do you think it can become a business case an industry harish yes i mean if you can hear me uh, so yes ma'am absolutely what arjit said uh, is about democratization yes. see the beauty of sustainable energy is that it it helps in democratizing health education livelihoods every other a service in many ways so in some ways you don't want sdg 7 it has to be an sdg 7 sdg 3 nexus sdg because ultimately the end value is education health livelihood it's not as unfortunately in our industry manu and harjit is that and and we talk about solar panels and batteries that's not what the value of sdg 7 is it's like us is there good health service like a premature baby scale baby warmer is it actually efficiently designed and running on by the way running on solar not making solar as a center piece right so that is why every today is how many solar panels i mean that who will see it's on the top of the roof here what does it provide below is actually more critical for example mm. same water pumps are very poorly designed because the water pumps in many ways is one of the most unenvironmental friendly because everybody wastes water because solar is free but water is not free now why right? it's the combination of better utilization of water with solar actually makes it more efficient rather than just solar water pump so this design thinking man is like yes in the same i used to run i mean i'm uh, uh, selco till 2014 before i jumped to the foundation side i, I know and my colleagues run it the issue is same in saying that as energy is democratized we we didn't want to scale up selco we said equivalent of similar organizations have to be created in manipur mm. in meghalaya decentralization for us decentralization of businesses was more critical and so the concept of street vending has scaled up but one single street vendor not actually becoming big how do you use sustainable energy also for distribution of wealth so we said boss selco yes karnataka but we have done 99% of the time we have made mistakes so how do we create an incubation center that basically incubate similar organizations with no connection to selco but so that they don't repeat the mistakes that we have done absolutely even in in covid my colleagues who run uh, selco have actually make it made it sustainable in terms of without laying off a single person in the last nine months of 600 people with 60 offices actually they will make profits this year continuously wow. for 14 years and we are called the leftist and we are called leftist i said boss that's great that we are called leftist while uber the biggest not for profit in the world will never make money but it's a market oriented company right one way or the other right so <laughs> so we need to relook at what sustain yes absolutely but problem kya hai manu is that paisa jo kisko milta powerpoint excel and word non english speakers ko nahi milta unless we create an appropriate ecosystem where vernacular crowd gets the same work, working capital that you and me get this country will actually create multiple decentralized energy enterprises that are located in parts of south odisha north odisha jharkhand and that's and that's all very viable models that can actually happen because they they understand the local needs they are they are partners with the local civil society rather than one big organization supplying again you go back to centralization as i said solar energy can be perfectly provided in a sustainable manner in with decentral no i you know i i like the way yeah, yeah. no I, i like the way you build this argument and uh, you know just like i mean solar energy in itself is uh, is a decentralized in a resource right. so can be these enterprises and but then uh, the question to you as a pioneer and as a leader in this uh, what do you think would be required to incubate such an ecosystem um, across the spectrum in in manipur in in any any remote parts where it is needed the most i mean what should we you know, do as people no you know this covid was a perfect example how most of the people who graduated from iits and i was the most useless people to in, help in the incubation for for enterprises because sab log ghar mein baithe the harish yaar um, i want have free time can i and they were had no clue 
of how to mentor such enterprises was they are all very good in where buffet rakha hua hai khane ke liye acha hai buffet but agar buffet ud gaya they have no clue carrots kahan se aayegi gajar ka banane ke liye and they were i tell my iti i'm friends boss they were the most useless to mentor any of the rural enterprises what we need to create mano is to shift or whatever subsidies that you are giving to iits and iams those needs to be given to the vocational schools like the iits and make itis those itis and the vocational schools should be the centers of innovation and excellent excellence create working capital for entrepreneurs to come out of there allocate money right. i'll allocate failure monies for them suddenly you'll see a scale up of innovations and enterprises i mean boss itis were primarily responsible for agricultural revolution it was not the iits and iams we need to go back to the grassroots about which are the institutions in this country that need that capital and that is the vocational schools we need to relook at and that's where scale up can happen at the grassroots level great great i like an iit in saying that uh, i hope your alumni is not listening to you i yaar subsidies mai ho raha kharagpur mein likha hua na in in us front mein if you go in the service of the nation i said which nation yaar so yeah no wonder <laughs> you are not a very likable person for many <laughs> so anyway great uh, so building on this part uh, you know incubating this uh, whole concept in itis creating that kind of a enabling environment for rural enterprises to come in because of course they feel the need and they just need to make a strong business case out of this uh, how do you uh, i mean harjeet uh, you know from a policy perspective what do you think uh, can be done should be done uh, to create this kind of an enabling environment and to i think there is also uh, if i may add um, a sense of urgency um, to it you know uh, we have a little time bomb ticking uh, somewhere there so how do you kind of look at policy but you know a policy that is able to action things uh, in shortest possible time so let me build on what harish already said you know and and you were also alluding to manu uh, it cannot be an afterthought um, and while developing countries uh, are struggling to make that transformation because of lack of resources but i can tell you that's where the most opportunities lie because we haven't yet made the the kind of infrastructure or the scale of infrastructure that you see in developed countries so we have a lot of unfinished work which we can relook at and redesign from the scratch you know hari has been giving examples of pumps and and all the basic thing that we are using because they have not been designed thinking of renewable energy whereas now we can uh, because if and th- this is where all these you know global un led conversations are important you know sometimes they sound very meaningless and very slow very frustrating but it is helping us set a template or a common goal for the entire global community so developed countries who have advanced economies but on the hind side uh, they have infrastructure built up and trust me they are struggling to make that shift and that's why such kind of uh, you know um, muscle flexing in in these global fora because they know they have a tough job and they would need trillions of dollars whereas we can do that now as we build our or uh, our infrastructure in many places it's going to be for the first time the housing that we are going to build the transport systems that we are going to look at In, in your report, uh, in your work with Selco, you have talked, you know, from a resilience point of view, you've already identified early warning systems and energy services, uh, health and education. But I am adding housing, infrastructure, and transport, uh, extremely important as well, uh, because you know we have always been saying disasters provide an opportunity of, of even of social reengineering. Uh, I think from now now when we talk about uh, energy. Um, food food security for instance has always been part of our response as well as you know rebuilding effort energy security and universal access now have to be at the core of it because we've always said that can we relook at economies and can we uh, you know make sure that people who were poor before disasters now have more resources we all did that you know tsunami was a classic case we had huge amount of money uh, and we we tried to do that and we were successful in some in some ways but again our thinking has always been how we can take them from 1 dollar a day to 2 dollar and 3 dollar a day 
I think we have to go beyond $3 a day mindset. Um, and it's energy which can make that happen. Yeah. To energy. And we need to bring it at the center of consumption, you know, for your production and then for your luxury. Still, we look at energy from a very, very basic perspective of meeting our basic needs. How can we use energy where rural masses uh, can now use sustainable energy access for production? So for not only for surviving, but also for thriving. Uh, we haven't done that work yet. I think yeah. policy is nowhere near. But I think as civil society, we've done some piloting, which now needs to inform policymaking. Yeah, and I think uh, we're very well uh, rounded it off uh, on this part that where is it that we need to bring these entry points? And I am I also tempted to take this conversation that we had today with institutions such as the Coalition of Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, which Prime Minister Modi, uh, you know, uh, launched uh, two years ago. Uh, because I think this is where, uh, you know, it needs to start, you know, it has to be at the basic design stage and it has to get into that criticality uh, of our um, approach on how we look at infrastructure and services uh, to be resilient to uh, such climate risks. So, yeah, no, I think I take this uh, very well. Um, I have one more question, which kind of takes us a little away from the discussion we have just had, but that is primarily to also um, speak to the audience and which is, um, you know, we come from the humanitarian space and uh, many of the organizations that are tuned in today uh, on this uh, cafe is, are working in the humanitarian space. So like seeds to to help you with this agenda that you have and you strongly feel about what can we do to make this uh, investment happen uh, because we are equally concerned about you know the, the the challenges the costs that are coming in for post-disaster relief and recovery which are mounting and therefore you know we are I think as a humanitarian sector we are looking at how do you kind of uh, get ahead of this curve, uh, which is seemingly, you know, getting increasingly steep by the day, by the year. So in, in any order, Harjit, you want to go first and then Harish. Um, yeah. Um, so Manu, one, one thing that humanitarian community needs to, needs to realize, and I still see uh, there's a long way um, uh, <laughs> to, to internalize when we look at climate, we only talk about um, certain onset events. There are so many slow onset events that are happening at this moment, which are changing our landscape. Yeah. Which are going to change our, our economy. Times of sea level rise. How many times we talk about the increasing pace of desertification? How many times we talk about ocean estification where millions of people depend on marine ecology, you know, and we exploit that. We don't. And which means that the impacts are going to see many people losing their income and livelihoods. We'll see millions of people on the move. We will need to see how technology can help them in early warning, in, in if they are making a move or if they have to shift their livelihood completely. Um, what are those new sectors that are emerging? How they can access government services, even when they're on the move, how they're going to behave when they are going to be completely relocated permanently. Technology, energy are going to play a very, very important role. Uh, but we have not even scratched the surface of that challenge. And it's not only uh, for India, multiple geoclimatic zones and is affected by all kinds of climatic disaster. You name it, and in India, we have it. Uh, but our, our policy uh, uh, architecture has not yet even understood. We are building infrastructure on the coast without looking at whether it's going to be on the sea in the next 20, 30 years or not. We are not doing those kind of assessments. So I think for humanitarian communities, first to understand 
the, the impact of climate change and, and the scale of it. And then look at the responses where energy, I keep saying, is going to play such a pivotal role, which we have not have had an experience of in the past. You know, humanitarian community always looks, uh, looks, you know, looks back and says, oh, you know, that was the kind of disaster, that's what I did. You know what, we'll have to start completely fresh with a clean slate because the world is going to look very different. And so that mindset shift, I don't think we still talk about. And I do see um, seeds uh, playing that role because you are already getting into that space. You are talking about design thinking. You're talking about 30 years from now, which many humanitarian agencies are not yet doing. So I, I would see, you know, definitely seeds uh, and organizations like yours can play a very important role. Oh, great. Thanks, uh, Harjit, on that point. In fact, uh, I, I picked that up. I mean, one is on the slow onset disasters and the other being that uh, how do you shift that mindset? And yeah, we, we do talk about uh, things in retrospect, but we hardly do anything about it. But to uh, give some credit to, uh, you know, the humanitarian sector, um, having realized this the hard way, uh, last few months, uh, and this is just few months, so obviously it's very initial days, there is now a very, very concerted action around looking at this whole piece of anticipatory action, as they call it, you know, how do you provide funding, how do you provide uh, uh, flexibility in funding uh, to be able to better anticipate, uh, you know, these disasters, and so the needle is shifting, uh, albeit very slowly, but there is, there is some movement there. And, and uh, of course, one would have liked it to be a stronger one. Uh, and, and of course, also backed by investment. But um, yes, yeah, that is where we are. But um, Harish, what do you think? Uh, what, what can the humanitarian sector do better from your perspective? I think together, uh, Manu, as we were spoken last time, I mean, if you look at, I mean, if you look at disasters, I mean, if I look at a pre, during and post, uh, ex yeah. uh, I mean, and and uh, like the floods, you can actually pre or a cyclone pre earthquake, you cannot, but but also, see, see for us, if I look at from an SDG 7 or a sustainable, uh, the, uh, the number of problem statements that comes from the humanity sectors in infinite but if they are like for example given to us were together saying that after or a disaster how much of the disaster was actually related to the disaster itself or because it was a man-made mistake like a poor housing quality right or a, or mm. that like flood ho gaya, uh, ghar gir gaya. but is or is it because the the because of the strength of the flood or the house was poorly designed for the flood to actually happen. So for the next time, we have less number of houses getting destroyed. If we can actually integrate that, that learnings, how do you come up with sustainable housing? And we talk about sustainable housing. Can we add sustainable and resilient housing? Right. So mm. Like or in Delhi last year, more number of people died inside the house during summer than outside the house because of poor construction of houses. That also is a disaster. Summer is a disaster, right? In a sense, because of very bad roofing and ventilation, yeah. right? So my question is, if if a matrix is drawn pre, during, post, and what are the options or matrix of um, basic uh, livelihood options? What are and then the delivery model? See, for example, how do I deliver today? For example, ten years ago, WHO used to buy vaccine refrigerators for five thousand euros. Today, also it buys at five thousand euros. Don't you think WHO should have invested and in saying that for the larger good of the society, can we work with manufacturers that we are putting, going to putting millions of dollars of R&D? End of the day, vaccine refrigerator has to be mobile. 1500 rupees can be applicable for any disasters, right? Yeah. So disaster yeah. and SDGs become a center of innovation for not only delivering better goods and services. As you said, the cost of delivering services is becoming, becoming expensive. That's because we are not innovating. We are not innovating yeah. and we are just saying that an SDG, uh, sorry, humanitarian services, whether you talk of refugee camps in Djibouti or in, in, in elsewhere, we are going with the same model 10, 15, 20 years ago. Same technology that is used in center of Bangalore. We have not innovated that. Obviously, transaction cost is going to be expensive. I think there has to be an R&D center between 
the two groups, the humanitarian group and the, and the sustainable energy group, which in the matrix that we can pick up, innovate in the delivery models, innovate in the technology that could then be used for any underserved communities in the, in the, in the, in the organization. That's oh, why yes, I think I we need yeah. to work on the problem statements and articulate it and create solutions for that together. No, no doubt, no doubt. In fact, you've given the right uh, ingredients for making a strong case for why humanitarian organizations need to look much broader than their uh, current outlook. Well, thank, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I think these are great inputs uh, and this con conversation will continue, but uh, I've also been getting some questions from the audience and uh, let me take this opportunity to ask one question that has come to me by Shri Prishtiji, whom we know very well is a, a, a great leader for us in the humanitarian community, uh, currently the president of Humanitarian Aid International. Um, so he asks, uh, there is a great opportunity for design a systems approach for scaling up. How do you think we can do that? I think this has been partly answered, but would any of you want to comment on this, uh, Ajit or Harish? Well, uh, th thank you, Mr. Ji. Hope, hope you're well. Um, um, so when we talk about scaling up, I, I think we need to really understand the problem, again, uh, building on what Harish said. What is our problem statement and what are the solutions? And we really need to pin down on specific solutions. Only those options can be scaled up sometimes. And we need to define the problem uh, or rather the specific problem in a manner where the solution can be achieved uh, with less complexity. You know, all the complexity that is there is goes into the thinking, but the solution deals with many of them. And it should be crafted in a manner that is scalable. Again, it's a design thinking that we do not do. We, in fact, I remember like 20 years ago when we were uh, thinking of developing some kind of metrics of success of CSOs. I remember in one of the conversation, they said, you know, you guys are bringing a corporate mindset to civil society. You know, you know it's such a complex thing. Everything is so complex. Everything is so uh, entangled that we can't really uh, you know, separate the strain. So don't even attempt to judge how we are faring. I don't think that's fair. Uh, we, we, we have to be very uh, clear. Yes, it's a complex thing when we talk about development, but you can develop metrics. You can come up with specific scalable solutions and it requires that, that shift in thinking. So I would say any problem, you know, whether it's a water filter, whether it's about early warning, I think we can productize it and we can come up with those solutions which can then respond to a larger set of issues but at least that solution is very specific and scalable yeah yeah harish would you like to add something well, to this? i mean exactly i mean the whole word we use is uh, replication and i think what happens is in the modern one we all i mean in a sense that how, i mean there are lots of processes that Unfortunately, we always reinvent the wheel, but it has worked in the field of water, the business model of delivery of model of, of water can always be actually used for deliver of energy, but we always think it's silos. Not the, issue. the problem, as Harjit Sab said, is our uh, graduation, our education system, a mechanical engineer. rural you're a solution provider, but you're not a mechanical engineer. I mean, a person who sells tomatoes, Tomorrow, the tomato price ho gaya. She will not sit in a house. Ke, I'm a tomato selling expertise. Then our three kids will starve. She will sell potatoes. The the problem Manu, is that as we get more educated, no, we get we are less useful to society, right? So the question is, how do we become solution oriented in what we do, and and that automatically links to so. Can we teach the youngsters who are in getting into the field of disaster management the tools and not solutions, mm. tools, and then you you basically use it as a puzzle to create solutions and that's where replication will happen that is leading to scale that yeah. fundamentally education system may into amara no i think you've raised the right points and uh, i feel that um, also if i take the classical approach of designing systems and system thinking uh, 
I mean, this whole thing around, um, you know, the three R's, like the you no know, uh, resources, rules and results and all of that. I feel that, you know, the systems thinking hasn't really, um, really explored this uh, nexus. And, you know, we, we, we try to think in silos and therefore it really requires a reboot in many ways when we now, and especially in the current context, uh, we've looked at pandemic and the disaster happening during a pandemic and you know the complications that uh, we had to face uh, all that has you know forced us to uh, take a look at whether systems approach can answer these kind of questions i mean um, uh, because it you know the institutions are already there you know the rules are already there now you can't you can't do a complete reboot so how do you tweak a system and I feel that going into this kind of a learning phase where you look at, you know, how you educate the communities, how do you uh, shift the, uh, the, the dominant narrative into these issues of solution finding in the given emergency phase that we are living in will lead to, you know, better rules, better resources and better results uh, that we are looking for. I think that would be the approach approach to, and that, that's what, if I can articulate what Harjeet and uh, Arish uh, just said. Uh, anything you would like to add? Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at possible questions that are coming in because this kind of ca uh, captured quite a lot of those observations that we can read on the screen. But anything -ish from your side, Manu, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a standard, you Manu, it's a standard from, a, I mean, whether it's a humanitarian or whether it's a, uh, sustainable energy, a civil society has to be a little more careful or a little more, what do you call it as, we, because civil society has to realize that the philanthropic money is the most expensive money. And we are most guilty in actually reinventing the wheel. We always keep bottom up approach on our reinventing, nahi karna chahi, but we are classic reinventors of everything that we do. Because we don't learn from any other sector because we are the superheroes of a sector, right? And saying that boss, baki sector kya as, as Harjit said, and we want to make it as complex so that the rest of the people don't understand it. Right? So the issue is philanthropic money is like if, like even for us who is not in disaster, what can I take from Manu that lowers my need for capital philanthropic money in a certain process so that I can use the same money to actually go forward to where money Manu has already learned in a successful or in a failed manner, right? Mm -hmm. How do, how do, and, and for that, I would ask all, whether it's humanitarian or our society to be little more, not little more, to be very transparent in our, in our mistakes. I, I'm not purposely telling the word learnings because, oh, I hate the word learnings, you know, because hum spin yeah, karke wo, ko learn kar de, learnings kar de. Boss, this is where we failed. So then another youngster does not use the same amount of capital to do the same bloody thing here. And that is where, as as mm. I would say, ki, and hum har samay bandaid ke upar bandaid dal rahe. Fracture hua hai, boss. Usko hum clear kare. But I want to learn from Manu and, and, and I think, Harjit sahab, aap, the, as you know that civil society players are more competitive than in the, in the, in the other sector. And that I think, uh, we need to uh, clear chaos and our goal should be kill ourselves yeah. we should not exist yeah, after five seven years but rather no, than i think one of them. <laughs> yeah yeah hajit what your, uh, your views i think resonate very well with ab absolutely <laughs> absolutely can't can't ag agree more i think we we have become you know, we, we think we are the custodian of whatever learning we, we create. I think we, we don't disseminate. We don't think our proposal will be made to make it and send it to our knowledge. Ko. Uh, while we, and when we do these learning, uh, uh, you know, if, if, you know, or as we call it, a learning sharing, uh, we preach to the converted. And we don't beyond that. You know, how this can really be scaled up and the money that, that we get, and if, uh, if I again build on what Hari said, it's, it's a very important piece of money. Government ka jo structure, hai, it is so straight jacketed that you can't do innovation. And, and many corporates cannot bring in the social justice aspect. This is why you need a civil society that has the flexibility 
uh, that is required for an innovation and has social bent of mind to create a public good. Now, imagine the sense of responsibility that we have on our shoulders, but we don't realize that. Or the flexibility we have, you know, the you know, we yes, it's not easy to raise money from donor. It's not as difficult. You talk to a person, uh, a, a, a simple shop owner who has to reach his or her shop at seven in the morning. And you know, and COVID has made us realize who the heroes are and superheroes are. Uh, these are the people who provide us basic services, you know, every day doing the same monotonous job. Um, and we want intellectual uh, uh, you know, um, sometimes, you know, let me not use those bad words, uh, but, you know, we just keep intellectualizing everything and, and get a sense of, uh, wow, we are doing something new every day. But the fact is, you're not doing something new, you're wasting resources in the name of doing something new. If you do one thing good in your life, which can then be scaled up, I think that should be the purpose of the money that you get. Uh, it is, a, it, this money comes from the same ordinary people who are, who are donating, whether it's mm -hmm. taxes, or direct donation. So I think we as civil society need to be very responsible. And I can I can say that we are not as much as we need to be. Great, I think this is a, a very strong, powerful message to all our civil society friends. And uh, this goes out to my colleagues and seeds as well. Uh, uh, how we uh, civil society not just have the responsibility of you know creating those public goods of being part of that uh, you know social justice uh, based uh, models uh, but also uh, be transparent about you know where the mistakes are and you know not try to always be the the the, the self righteous kind of you know attitude where we think we have the solutions for all and let's accept where the mistakes are so that you know, we, we as an as a ecosystem, as an as a alliance, we learn from each other and build on that. I think that's a great note to end this conversation. Um, it, uh, we are almost to the end of our time. I just want to use that last minute to say thank you to you, uh, Harish, uh, for joining uh, for this call. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that this conversation is happening with a larger audience uh, out there somewhere in the virtual world. Um, and and uh, hopefully we can, they will feed back into enriching this further um, as we go along, because uh, we started with one district, one health center in Risa uh, that was recovering from the Cyclone Fawny impact. Uh, uh, but, and, and there's been so much of learning from that one experience. I think if we start putting all of those similar experiences from our around the world together, I think uh, we will make a very, very strong case for us to take up uh, both at policy level as well as in practice. Harji, thanks very much. And uh, I think we'll continue to pick up your brains on you know, what would be that policy pathway as we move further into practice, both CELCO and SEEDS, uh, because we are very committed uh, to work together to build on this case. Uh, not just that one, but, you know, like what Harish said, uh, create a very strong case to, uh, you know, bring it in the design thinking, bring it in our mitigation approaches, uh, disaster risk reduction uh, area, and, and, and this whole area of anticipatory action that we are all uh, working uh, in. So with those words, uh, a great thank you to all of you and to colleagues in Selco who worked on this project in Risa and my colleagues in Seeds. Uh, thank you very much. And to all those who are organizing, to Abhishek, to Arvin, who are doing the stage management here to ensure that we have this glitch-free uh, you know, meeting, uh, cafe meeting. And let's... Uh, keep this conversation going. So thank you very much. And Pleasure to join. Ending. Thank you so much and good luck.